quite an amazing um, topic that we have tonight, which is called root cause resolution, which really is the crux and the core of medicine, getting down to the re root cause, not a pill for an ill, not a one size fits, fits all, but getting down to the root cause of what really matters and listening intently to what our patients are suffering from. So my name is Dr. Lily Rosenthal. I practice here in Manhattan, just a couple of blocks uptown from here. I'm an osteopathic physician. DO denotes uh, doctor of osteopathy. And I'm also a physiatrist, a, f a specialist in physical medicine and rehabilitation. Tonight I'm going to talk to you about the interrelationship, the marriage, the link between structure and function of the body. And something that we don't really think about, the, the body doesn't lie. People do. Patients might, but the body doesn't lie. So there's so much information that we can get from examining the body in a very, very deep way. And I hope to share my 25 years of clinical practice with you on this very important subject. So exploring some of my roots as an osteopathic physician, I was first drawn to osteopathy as when I was in college, long, long time ago, um, because I've investigated my own personal health as a dancer, a runner, and a vegetarian. I had my own feelings about how to stay healthy and how to function optimally. So I was drawn to the field. I didn't even know what a DO was or what osteopathic medicine was because we're, I think, 8% of the physician force in this country. There are a couple of you out here tonight that I had the pleasure of meeting and hopefully many of you viewing at home. But what really attracted me was the whole person approach to how we take care of patients. So the tenets, the four basic principles of osteopathic medicine, which are also shared by many of you integrative practitioners here in this space and viewing at home, I'll go through them with you. The first is that the body is a unit, and the person is a unit of body, mind, and spirit. We're not just a meniscal tear in our knee. We're not just a herniated disc in our neck. We're human beings. We're living, breathing human beings with a mind and a spirit as well as a body. The second, very important, the second principle of osteopathic medicine is that the body is capable of self-regulation, self-healing, and self-maintenance. That's amazing. We are living, breathing, dynamic beings, and we heal. It sounds magical, and it really is. Simple example, we know we cut our hand, it glues together, it mends. We break a bone, the body mends. If we as healthcare practitioners can actually support this extremely powerful ability of the body, we really have it made, and we can really transform the lives of, of all of our patients. So self-regulating, self-healing, and self-maintenance. No pill or procedure even comes close to harnessing this power. The third, which is the, basically the, the highlight of what I'm going to be speaking about this evening, is that, that structure and function are reciprocally interrelated. The structure matters. It, it actually directs the function. We'll be speaking in detail about this. The fourth, which is basically an all of the above, is that rational treatment is based on the three principles above. So as a physical medicine specialist and an osteopathic physician, patients come into my office not because they're feeling great. Um, we have lovely relationships, but it's because they hurt. They're in pain. So I'm known as a pain doctor. And my goal is to help my patients feel and function better. I think that's probably true of all of us and the patients that we see. They come in for either an illness or an injury, and they want to feel and function optimally. So that I see is my role. And what do I do? I help repair the structure of their body to restore optimal function. An everyday example, a non-medical example, if we have a punctured tire in our car, the car is not going to run. If we have a drinking straw that we want to take the fluids and, and drink it, if the straw is bent, we're not going to get optimal flow. This happens in the body as well. If there are restrictions in the body, we're not going to get op optimal flow. We won't get optimal circulation, oxygenation. The body will not be doing its thing. So that's a very, very simple example of everyday experience as well as medical experience, which I'm going to discuss. Diagnostic tools. In this age of very modern technology, in this very busy city of Manhattan, New York City, my favorite and most used diagnostic tools I have with me 24 hours a day. They're my eyes, my ears and my hands. My eyes are used to observe patients. 
to look at how they're standing, how they're sitting, how they're walking, if they look healthy, are they vital, do I see asymmetries in their bodies, how are they walking, deep, deep powers of observation. Ears. I take a very, very detailed history. There's so much, we get 99% of our information from just deep listening and deep observing, and I'll discuss hands in a moment. But what do I listen for? I listen for the suffering, I listen for the fear, I listen for the challenges that they're having, I listen to when they're in pain, what's the quality of pain, how do they hurt, why do they hurt, when does it get better? These questions need to be asked and they take, take time, and there's no substitute for observing and deep listening. My hands, as an osteopathic physician, these are 10 fingers that are used every day on every patient. I actually examine my patients in an extremely detailed way because the body doesn't lie. And I can read the body and get information that the most expensive or technologically advanced MRI, X-ray imaging study can never ever pick up. So my eyes and my ears and my hands are three of my most valuable diagnostic tools and I want to incent you to remember these in your next physical examination with your next patient when you go to the office tomorrow. Structural examination. With my hands I do a structural examination which includes looking at the asymmetry. Is one shoulder higher than the other? What are the person's habits? What do they do? How do they get into trouble? I look for asymmetry because again structure matters. Structure affects function. I look at range of motion. Can the patient rotate well to the right, but not so well to the left? Are they, croc are they holding the phone in their ear, which impairs their range of motion? These are the questions, these are the details, these are the risk factors, these are the root of why, the patient, why our patients are not feeling optimally. I also look for tissue texture. When I examine a patient, my hands are placed, it gives me so much information. There are so many clues to the patient's history, habit, and how the patient is taking care of themselves. So if I find congestion, that can mean that the lymphatics are not flowing so well and we have congestion in the body, the body is not rid ridding itself of toxins normally or naturally. So all of these things matter. Not so fancy, very basic, but powerful and oh so important. Treatment. So once we identify some of these areas, what do, we, what do I do? What do we do about them? So like Dr. Brogan, I have a very good partnership with my patients and we do this together. What I do can do passively to help repair the structure, osteopathic manipulation. I put my hands on the patient to actually affect the structure positively to help with the function. Some of you might know some certain techniques in the physical therapy world, the chiropractic world, we have different nomenclature, but you know what I'm talking about. So structure is huge. What I can do with my hands, it's the best thing closest to instant gratification that we can get. Patients actually leave my practice feeling better with no side effects. So techniques like myofascial release, things like high velocity, these are things that I can do to place my hands to therapeutically treat patients to improve their structure almost immediately. But they'll get into trouble again if we don't talk about the risk factors and why they got into trouble in the first place. So of course, ex every patient leaves my office. In fact, I have a prescription pad that I rarely write for medications, but I do write for exercises. I do write for nutrition. I do write for the things that are, self-care is health care. So patients need to, they're with me for an hour. I can help them temporarily, but they're with themselves for the other 23 hours of the day and what they do matters. So I take my role as a physician educator extremely seriously. So beyond osteopathic manipulation, exercise and stretches, Lifestyle modifications, things like diet, posture, prevention, stress management, sleep management. Nobody leaves my office without getting this very comprehensive talk. So very quickly, um, and first of all, I see a lot of, um, I have the pleasure of treating a lot of world-class musicians, artists, dancers, and athletes in my office. And I think that's a very sort of easy leap of, of understanding is that if the structure, if a tennis player sprains his ankle, they can't function. If a dancer twists her back, she can't perform. So, and we all have this in various um, ways in our own personal lives. But I'm going to give you a brief case history of a patient, very typical, 65-year-old woman comes to see me with a 10-year history of headache. Awful, miserable. She has intermittent numbness in her right hand in the ulnar distribution. For those who are not musculoskeletally oriented, it's the right fourth and fifth finger. And she's been through the gamut. She's been to multiple physicians, very, very good ones, in fact. C1, 
C-spine, her neck, her, the MRI of her neck, negative for, everybody's looking for a disc. What's going on? Why does she have numbness? Normal, negative, or as negative as MRIs can ever get. NCV EMG, negative, nerve test. She doesn't have a permanent nerve injury. She's been on migraine medications, opioids, multiple medications, still suffering after 10 years. What did I do differently? I spoke to her and I examined her. Turns out she had tension in her upper trapezius in a muscle. This is a silly, silly, easy, easy problem to, to correct if you only ask the question and examine the patient. So she had a trigger point. We worked on that. I did some manipulation. I also noticed when examining her, she had thoracic outlet syndrome, a syndrome where the, not a big deal from a, a, a medical standpoint, but from a quality of life standpoint, a very, very big deal. So the structure, the tension, the creation of an elevated shoulder and muscular tension was causing this headache. Easy, easy problem. We are missing this as a community. Western medicine is missing all of this. So talking to and examining our patients absolutely matters and paying attention to the structure. So in summary, I implore you to get to the root, to dig deep, to find the roots and the risk factors. If you're not inclined and are not comfortable with a structural examination or physical examination from a uh, musculoskeletal standpoint, please, please recognize that this is essential and refer to people who do because you're going to uncover, you're going to help your patient uncover so many important details. So please remember again to re respect as well as recognize the relationship between structure and function. They are inextricably linked. And if we don't consider this, you're going to be missing a big piece of taking care of patients. Thanks so much for watching. And for more great clips like this, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. I've created a special free video just for you called Harnessing the Power of Community in Your Practice. And it'll give you a clinical model, practical tools that double as marketing, and strategies to develop a community of your peers. All you have to do is click on the link below.